I would like to introduce Dr. Kerry Firestein from Allied Physicians Group, who will be leading our discussion this evening. Hi, I'm Dr. Kerry Firestein, Chief Executive Officer of Allied Physicians Group, practicing pediatrician for over 30 years, mother of three, and now grandmother of one. This little one was born at the start of COVID when we started our webinars. He's now almost six months old. He's six months old today, as mommy uh, corrects me. Um, we spend so much time trying to get pregnant and thinking about being pregnant that I thought it would be nice to remind everybody where you're going with this and how much fun you're gonna have soon. And now, as is a grandmother's prerogative, I am going to give him off to his mama. So having a new baby is so exciting. It's a wonderful time, but it's also a little bit scary. Everybody wants to do the right thing, but who knows what the right thing is? Well, you've taken the first step today because not only are you gonna learn a lot of great information, but you've picked a source, a trusted source of information. There are so many decisions as a parent that you need to make every day that you can't research everyone. You need to pick somebody that you trust and then depend on them. An allied physicians group is an excellent place for that. We have lots of education. You can check on our website. We also have 33 offices across lower New York State. If you choose one of our offices, you know that all of the doctors there are independent. Um, the, there's an owner on site who's going to be helping you. All of the doctors before they join us have been pre-screened for quality. We're all level three medical homes. Um, and then there's ongoing quality that goes throughout. So tonight you're gonna learn a lot of cool things and I'm gonna introduce our panel to you. So it's me, Dr. Svitak, Dr. Jassy, and Dr. Goldstein, and I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. Dr. Svitak? Thank you, Carrie. Hi, I'm Dr. Scott Sweetek. I'm a practicing pediatrician uh, in Comac, Long Island. I've been a member of Allied since its inception, and uh, it's my pleasure to speak with you this evening. Dr. Jassy. Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Jonathan Jassy. I am a pediatrician in Belmore, Long Island uh, for the past 13 years, and I'm a father of three daughters, 13, 11, and 8. Um, and everybody's in for an incredible journey, and congratulations to everybody out there. Dr. Goldstein. Hi, I'm Jamie Goldstein from Monroe, New York. We are the northernmost of uh, the allied practices. Uh, there are six doctors in our group, and I'm proud to have been a member of our group for 17 years and a member of Allied for Seven. Congratulations. This is going to be a phenomenal ride for you guys. Thank you, everybody. So Dr. Jassy, would you like to kick us off? Sure. All right. So there's going to be a lot of good information that you guys are going to learn tonight. So off the bat, I always like to tell all of my new patients that all the advice that you are going to be getting from everybody, your pediatrician, other doctors, family, friends, you're going to eventually take all of that information and mold it into how you are, are then going to be raising your own child. So we're going to give you a lot of good information out there that should be very useful. So first, we're going to talk about some feeding, which is a lot of everybody's big question, uh, especially for a brand new parent uh, that is kind of foreign to this and how much should we be giving, how often, and so forth. So first off, let's talk about some hunger cues. And there's a lot of different type of hunger cues that you are going to be noticing on your own baby. Um, you're eventually going to learn your really own, own baby's hunger cues, uh, and you will learn so many different things about them. So whatever that we say, even on this end, you're going to learn it really yourself. But when it really comes down to it, some signs of, of some hunger cues, uh, number one would be rooting. That's a very newborn, it's a very common newborn reflex for babies to have where they could be rooting and going at the actual parent, whether it's nursing or going for a bottle at that point. But that could definitely be a sign of, of, then, of then hunger. So something to be looking out for. Um, putting our own hand to the mouth. That's a very common sign also, or sucking on things as well. That could be a sign of, of, then, of, of then hunger. As time goes on, as the months progress, eventually that could be signs of teething and stuff too. But in the very early get-go, that could be a, a potential hunger cue. And then lastly, crying. You know, that's 
as unfortunately for all these babies, they don't have any other effective way to communicate with us outside of crying. And crying can mean many various different things. It could be discomfort, it could be feeling cold, it could be a dirty diaper, but it could also mean hunger as well. So again, you will eventually learn your own baby with these sets. As far as how much, um, that's a variable answer too. You know, I feel like it really depends on how often a child is feeding, um, how much do they weigh, and so forth. But when it really boils down to it, in the very early get-go, we are not going to be really eating a heck of a lot as far as quantity. Um, as far as frequency, it might be a lot more frequent. So as far as how much for a nursing child, they could be clustering, could be every hour or two uh, until the milk can come in, which can take a good week or two of life for that to happen. Then it's usually even every two to three hours to get the milk flow in. So that could be eight to 12 times within a, within a good 24 hour period. And then after that, maybe in the first month, it could be every two to three hours, two to four hours. Uh, and that's more as far as nursing. As far as bottle feeding kids, uh, in the very early gecko, it might be every two to three hours or then every two to four hours at that point. Um, but in the very couple of days or first week of life, it might be a half of an ounce, it could be a full ounce. Um, and that's gonna slowly increase as the weeks go on too, because as we keep on getting our weight that we should, we're gonna definitely need a lot more calories in order to keep on gaining that actual weight. So it's gonna slowly increase. And there are some one month olds that if they're bottle feeding, whether it's pump breast milk or then formula, it could be two to four ounces potentially, even two months, it could be four to six ounces. It really uh, depends on the many aspects there. But um, as far as a nursing baby, uh, usually a, an efficient nursing is usually about 15, maybe 20 minutes on then each side. And that will be once the actual milk flow will then come in. For me, I always like to, to then tell parents two signs, especially if we are bottle feeding, or even if we aren't, um, as far as if we need to be taking more is if we are taking any sort of bottle, if we're taking the entire amount, and if we are looking like we want a little bit more, then that could be a sign you might have to increase it. Or if we're not lasting our, our, our usual length of time between feedings, that's a, could, that potentially could be another sign that you might have to increase the amount for each feeding as well. Now, how do we know if we're getting enough uh, well, first off, is the baby feeling um, satiated? Are they seem, do they seem satisfied? Are they sleeping? Uh, are, are they lasting until that actual next feeding? So those could be some signs as far as, um, you know, getting enough at that point. But also wet diapers is really, really, really crucial. And, and that's a good sign for us if we are staying hydrated and getting enough fluids. So generally speaking, the first couple of days of life, it might only be a, a good handful of diapers. But generally speaking, once we're really getting enough fluids, we should be urinating at least uh, six to eight times within a 24 hour period. But for me, the biggest culprit that is telling us are we getting enough is how are we doing for every checkup as far as growth curves. And if we're really getting enough, the proof is really in that pudding right there on what the growth is showing us, and especially from a weight perspective, and then showing us that we, that we are getting enough calories. And I think that will make you feel a lot more satisfied, whether it's on, on the baby's first checkup, um, it's very common for babies can lose up to 10% of birth weight within the first week of life. Uh, so when we get you in for that first checkup, we definitely want to be seeing, are we increasing the amount of, uh, of weight from the actual discharge weight? If not, we might have to get babies back in for a weight check a good week later, sometimes a few days later, depending on the situation. Uh, and then from there, once we see you for then checkups, we could then see, are we getting enough calories at that point? So that's pretty much about the feeding. So next slide. My other big favorite topic I love to talk to parents about is that is really about sleeping. And that's a common question, probably more, arguably the most commonest question that a, a brand newborn might have as far as from a brand new parent is about sleep. And that's something that you're, you should find a pediatrician that you're comfortable with that is going to be willing to work with you at that point in time and to go over a lot of various things because every kid is different. There are no two kids that are exactly alike, whether in your same family or overall. So everybody can have different experiences with things. But as far as quantity of sleep, in the very early get-go, we're going to be sleeping 20 plus hours a day within a good 24-hour period. Um, and it's kind of inversely proportional to how old that you are. As we keep on getting older, we're going to definitely be able to stimulate the, the actual child that much more and they will not need as much sleep. So as the months go on, the sleep, the quantity of sleep for the 24 hour period will get less and less. Uh, but again, the five things they do in the very early gecko 
is eat, pee, poop, cry, and sleep. So sleeping is gonna be a big, big thing there. Um, now, as far as quality of sleep, that's probably even more of an important thing than the quantity per se, because quality, ideally, we want eventually to be sleeping through the night, and that might not happen, obviously, right away, but there are a lot of babies that even in the first two to three months of life, you can potentially get them going six to eight hours between meals a night. Some kids know, some kids are ready for it. Um, it depends on many circumstances. And it could be in the first six months of life. Um, it could be even longer. Unfortunately, teething can begin around six months as well. And that's when, if we're not already sleeping through the night, the sleep habits can get a little bit hairy on you at that point. And you know, and you might have some difficulties from the sleeping on a teething child, depending on the child. Um, but as far as, uh, you know, it's very common when we're up to be feeding, we're gonna be feeding and then hopefully going to sleep. And that would be a more content baby there. As far as eating and cranky a lot at night, that's a whole nother circumstance from a quality perspective of sleep. So, um, you know, if that's going on, then that's something that you should definitely discuss with your, with your pediatrician, because there could be a potential GI issue going on that's causing us to be waking a lot at nighttime as well whether it's gas pain or reflux or potential milk culture allergy or something like that going on. So that's that. But more importantly, even than the quantity and, and, and the quality is safe sleeping. And that's something that any pediatrician would highly, highly recommend. So a good, a couple of pointers on safe sleeping. Well, since the 1990s, the American Academy of Pediatrics came out with a back to sleep campaign. And that was really to try to decrease the amount of SIDS that, that, that they were seeing. And since the advent of that, you know, amazingly so, the, the rates of SIDS have gone down dramatically from that. So there is definitely something to it with the whole back to sleep campaign. So back to sleep is really important. No, no uh, tummy sleeping, uh, not even sleeping on the side. Ideally back would be best at that point. But there are other things too that you want it to be really safe. Um, you don't want to have any bedding inside the actual crib or the bassinet no pillows or blankets or anything that can get over the child's face because that could be problematic for that baby. Uh, no other soft objects in the crib as well. No bumpers. That could be a, a potential no-no because -no the baby's head can get lodged in, in, in then between there. So I wouldn't recommend that. Um, also sleeping in their own bassinet or their own crib would be ideal, even if it's, it should be in then your own room as well but no parent's bed, not really a great thing on many aspects, but especially from a safety perspective. Unfortunately, there have been horror stories that you read about or hear about or even potentially even see with babies, uh, where the parent accidentally rolls on top of the baby or babies falling off, off of the bed and landing on, on the floor. So there could be some horror stories there. So ideally they should not be in there and that would be the safest. Um, no smoking, that's another big one as well. That could lead to increased risk of SIDS. Um, temperature is another big thing with no mother or father alike can always agree on a temperature inside the house as is, but a good ideal temperature is maybe 68 to 72 degrees inside there. I think that's a general rule of thumb that a lot of people try to use. Uh, so that could be a good temperature there. So we're not overheated. Um, so that's a big thing. And then also pacifiers. There've been some studies out there that suggest that actually that could decrease the incidence of SIDS as well. So even if that's given after a couple of weeks of life, uh, I, I personally find that nipple confusion from a, from a nursing child, I feel that's a little overrated. I feel like I don't really see that often at all, but I'm, a, I'm definitely a big fan of the pacifier. It definitely serves its own purpose. Um, and again, it could, it could decrease the incidence of SIDS. All right, so next slide. All right, so swaddling. So from a swaddling perspective, I'm a big fan of that. I use that on my three daughters. I loved it. I felt like it really helped comfort them. Uh, it's not for everybody. So if there are some babies that don't like to be swaddled, then that's fine too. Uh, but I feel like it, that, that usually that child will feel like they're back in the mother's womb and that they are being held and comforted at that point in time. So sometimes that will help uh, more of a irritable child. Also, it can help them with sleep sometimes as well. But if you're doing it, the whole point of it is doing it safely as well. Um, there's some newer reports. Can it affect the actual hips? Um, so first off, and every kid's different as far as with their hands in or then hands out. But when it comes down to it, you don't want to swaddle them super duper tight at that point in time where it can be constraining the actual hips. You want the, their actual hips having the ability to move in there. And a lot of the newer contractions out there have like some pockets and stuff where you could put their, the actual legs into before wrapping them, them uh, up there. 
and that's good. So then it will give them some, some, some freedom there. And then you don't want to straighten their own uh, legs out completely straight and then wrap them tight too, because that also can increase any risk of, of something called hip dysplasia, which babies can get, which could be a, a serious condition to their hips, which can affect their ability to walk later on. So um, yeah, you know, once it comes down to it, if you're doing it in a smart way and, and then a safe way, swaddling could be your, your actual best friend. All right, so next slide, okay. And this is my favorite stuff to talk about, uh, the practical stuff with babies. Your pediatrician, while we have the book knowledge, most of us also are parents ourselves, and we're gonna tell you the practical part of raising a child in addition to the book knowledge that you don't have that it's our job to share with you. Diapers, doesn't matter what kind of diaper you buy. You can do disposable, you can do cloth. Um, the thing about diapers, and I find it across all brands, is that they are very absorbent and they increase the temperature in the diaper area. So children are more prone to rashes. Uh, they're more prone to penile and labial adhesions where the foreskin um, in a circumcised child has been cut off, but the sides of the penis will adhere to the head or the inner lips on a little girl will seal shut. I'm a big fan of giving every child airtime. So after they've peed or pooped, have them out on a bunch of towels or blankets that you don't care about and let them air out their private areas for a good 15, 20 minutes a day. It'll help keep their skin healthy so that they're less likely to get fungal rashes. Uh, it'll help keep those adhesions from happening. And of course, if you see any rashes, contact your pediatrician. Uh, because we can guide you, is this just a plain old diaper rash from irritation or is this something fungal where you need a prescription cream? Nails. Nails are tough. Baby nails grow insanely quickly. They're very sharp and they're very thin. Not a big fan of nail clippers. Most of the pediatricians I know aren't because babies wiggle so much, it's very easy to accidentally clip their skin. So I do recommend getting baby nail files or a very gentle nail file. And when the baby is calm, either at the breast or, or sleeping if their hands are out, then you can gently file their nails down um, so that they're not scratching at themselves because in the beginning, they don't really have great hand control. Uh, and so you'll often find scratch marks on your child. It's okay, it happens, um, but nail files are the way to go. Ears, babies make a ton of wax and wax is protective. Your body's supposed to make it. We don't recommend Q-tips. It can actually push the wax further in and create a, a wall where the sound can't get through so well and it can affect hearing. So we recommend that when you're bathing your child, if you see wax coming towards the outer part of the ear, you just grab it with your pinky gently um, or maybe a Q-tip if it's right there at the tip at the end. Otherwise, just wait for the wax to come out and, and know that wax is okay. Your umbilical cord. That can stay on for a couple of weeks, depending on how deep it is in the skin. You don't really have to do anything for it. It will dry up on its own. Um, when it does fall off, sometimes you'll see like a yellow sticky tissue that's left behind. That's healing tissue. It's not infection. Uh, if it's there for more than a day or two, let your pediatrician know. Oftentimes there's something they can do to help speed up that healing process. Um, if the area around the cord becomes red and hot, and when you touch it, your baby seems uncomfortable, or there's a very horrible smell or awful smell, contact your pediatrician immediately. Um, that's something that needs to be seen. Do not give your baby a, a bath in submerging them in water until the um, umbilical area is fully dry. Circumcision. Most of the time it's an ob guy that does the circumcision in the, in the hospital for you. It's not the pediatrician, but we get to see the circumcisions after and it's a very common question. Did they cut enough skin? Um, I assure you, they know what they're doing. Um, when you come to see us, the baby will still be having A and D ointment or an antibiotic ointment placed on the head of the penis with a gauze pad on there. And you may, as you're changing your baby, again, see that yellow sticky tissue. That's normal, it's healing tissue, don't wipe it off. Um, and then to prevent 
adhesion where the sides of the penis stick to the head as they're getting bigger and there's a little fat pad down by their penis that makes the skin kind of rise. You want to put Vaseline on the head of the penis um, just to keep it nice and lubricated and again give them air time. Same thing with little girls. Little girls don't get circumcised, but you want to give them air time to prevent rashes and to keep the labia from adhering. You can do a little Vaseline or A&D ointment in the diaper area to help protect the skin and, and prevent adhesions. And one thing that parents of newborn baby girls often are not aware of is anywhere from day five to seven after they've been born, they may have a little bloody vaginal discharge. I explain it to my parents as it's kind of like having a little mini period. Mom's hormones are withdrawing from the baby. Do not be nervous. It's normal. Baby vaginas produce a lot of mucus, and for maybe a day, a little bit of bloody mucus, that's to be expected. Lastly, baby skin. Their skin compare, surface area compared to their body mass is huge. They lose a lot of moisture through their skin. So it's important that um, you keep them moisturized. I like A and D. Um, in the beginning, you may find that they're peeling. They've been in a bathtub for 10 months. It's normal for that outer layer of skin to kind of peel off. Don't pick at it, it'll come off on its own. When you do bathe your baby, I recommend something gentle. Uh, depending on where you live, depends on the water quality. Up where I am, we have hard water, so there are certain soaps at, uh, that work better for the children where I am than maybe down in the city or Long Island. Um, but talk to your pediatrician about what products they find work best for the children. Rashes in the beginning, super common. Their skin is getting used to being out in the world, so you may see red pimples that come and go. That's normal. Baby acne usually comes around three to four weeks. They'll get pimples on their chin, their upper chest, their back, normal. Uh, but if you see something that you're concerned about, do not hesitate to reach out to your pediatricians. That's why we're here for you. Next slide. Okay, when to worry. Number one, fever. Anything over 100.4 rectal is a fever. And in those first six weeks of life, that's concerning to us. There are various infections that a baby can get um, in those first six weeks of life that can be really serious. And because their skulls are wide open or because they're so little, they don't get the same response that children and adults have, you may not realize that they're as sick as they are. So if your baby feels warm, take their temperature rectally. And if it's 100.4, call your doctor. Even in the middle of the night, there's always someone on call for you to answer your questions and deal with emergencies. And in those first six weeks, fever's an emergency, okay? Uh, don't give Tylenol until you've checked with your pediatrician in those, those first few weeks and absolutely no Advil or Motrin. That's not okay until they're about six months old. Um, make sure that they're not overdressed. Overdressing a baby can lead to a fever or a presumed fever. So your baby really only needs one layer of clothing more than you're comfortable in come the fall and winter. So if you've got a baby who's wearing a snowsuit and blankets and it's 60 degrees outside, you've overdressed your baby and you've triggered a fever, which isn't real. Next, hiccups. It's just a immature nervous system. Very common for babies to get hiccups, especially after feeding. It bothers you more than it bothers them and they will go away. So it's okay, especially in those first few weeks, you're gonna see a lot of hiccuping. It should go away as they get older and bigger. Um, some parents even tell me the babies were hiccuping in the womb and they, the moms felt it then. So it does go away, nothing to be concerned about. Pardon me, sneezing, very common. Babies can't blow their noses and clear their throats the way that children and adults can. And they're constantly filtering the air we breathe. So sneezing is how they clear their airways. It's not necessarily a sign of infection. It's not a sign of allergies, not in those first few weeks. So if your baby's sneezing and nothing else is going on, it's okay. If they sound stuffy and congested, squirt a little saline up their nose, and then there's various suction devices you can use to try and get that mucus out. Um, or you could just squirt the saline up. They'll cough, they'll choke, because it goes down the back of the throat, but it'll help get that mucus that's bothering them out of the way. Periodic breathing. This scares parents. Babies, especially in the newborn period, will start to pant like they're a dog. <laughs> and then they hold their breath. It's normal. Again, it's from an immature nervous system. It only lasts for the first few weeks and then it goes away. Um, so just watch your baby when it's happening. Take a deep breath. 
And as long as the baby's not having a fever or seems in distress, you're okay and so is the baby. Lastly, eyes crossing. So a funny story, I had my first baby, I had a C-section. I did not get to see him for the first 24 hours. He was in the ICU for sugar issues. And my husband said to me, Jamie, his eyes are moving all over. And I went and I saw him and his eyes were moving all over. And as a pediatrician, I knew he was fine, but I still went up to the NICU attending and said, is he having a seizure? And they just chuckled and laughed at me. In the beginning, newborns don't have control of their eyes. You'll see their eyes cross. They may move around a little bit. They can see only about a foot in front of them and in black and white. So unless you're really close, they're not really going to focus. So it's okay if the eyes cross or move around a little bit. Relax. As the brain matures, their eyes will start to focus. Next slide. Okay. Okay, that's me. Hello, everyone. Um, when I was talking to my family that I was going to be uh, participating in this webinar, I told my son the topics I was talking about. And when he heard that one was how to choose a pediatrician, he said, make it short and simple. Choose me. But obviously, that's not going to work for everyone. So if the option to choose me is not your main option, there are ways that you can gather information about what the right pediatrician for you is. Uh, there are many different avenues that, that people will use to gain information about pediatricians in the area. The first thing you want to keep in mind is you probably want to find a pediatrician near you. You know, even if you have the greatest pediatrician in the world driving for 45 minutes to an hour, the multiple times you need to for the visits or during the times when you have a sick child who may be screaming with an ear infection is not something you want to do. So location is going to be the first choice. After that, I, I always recommend talking to people who you know, who know you, who you respect and whose opinion you trust. Those would be friends, family members, neighbors, co-workers, people who know you and know what kind of person you need and what kind of pediatrician would work well for you and your personality. Uh, for years and decades, uh, we've often given the recommendation of talk to your obstetrician. Uh, for many years uh, and, and throughout most of our history, the obstetricians have had a close working relationship with the pediatricians. I hesitate only slightly to make that recommendation these days because unfortunately, many doctors' offices, including obstetricians, are working for a hospital system or a corporate entity that may limit who they're allowed to refer to and they may not have the freedom to refer to the doctor that they feel would be best for you. Once again, a great resource, but, but keep that in mind. Last but not least, a lot of people will refer to websites. Uh, I've had parents tell me they found me on Yelp uh, or other doctor websites that, that rate how doctors go. Uh, an excellent source as a jumping off point. I am always a little leery and say, take this information with maybe a grain of salt, just like you looking at a website or a view of a restaurant or a hotel, sometimes People may not have participated or, or visited that office. Other times, if there is one bad review, it might just be somebody who's had a bad day or a one-time bad experience. It does not definitely indicate what you expect at that office. So now you've done your research, you've come up with your short list of pediatricians in your area. You wanna now, what's the next step we do to figure out who do we choose? Well, to me, my advice is, is you contact those offices. Um, most offices, and I, I believe throughout all of Ally, we, we all participate in what we call either prenatal visits. Uh, in my office, we call that the meet the mom or meet the parent visits. Where you get a chance to come into the office, you get to see the layout of the office, how it looks, parking. You get to meet some of the staff, see are they happy, friendly, welcoming, or are you going to feel comfortable there? And you get a chance to sit down with one of the pediatricians. Now, um, different people approach this visit in different ways. I, I've had a great many patients come in to just get a feel, to get a gestalt on, on whether this uh, office is good for me. I've had people come in with 83 questions and a whole list of battery of questions they want to ask. Whatever makes you feel comfortable is, of course, what's important. Many of the questions I get asked or we get asked for these questions uh, revolve around our schedule. Do we have night and weekend hours? Because that could be very important if both parents have to work and they do not want to necessarily take time off to come bring their child to the doctor. Um, 
how do they deal with well visits and sick visits? So do they have a separate waiting room for one? Are there different times? Um, can I call the pediatrician? Uh, what happens if I need to speak to him during the day? What happens on the nights? What happens in the weekends? Um, you know, what are different policies of the office? What's their policy on vaccination and, and, and other care of the child? Long and short of it, the whole idea of these visits are to try to get a feeling that you would feel comfortable with this office to be a partner for you. And that's what we're really trying to set up is a partnership for many years with our goal of helping you raise a happy, healthy child. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, now you've gone through all that and you've found your doctor. You've decided on the pediatrician. You've gone through your pregnancy and you're now in the hospital. You've just had a beautiful, perfect pregnancy. No problems. You've had a beautiful delivery. Everything is going great. It's time to go home. So now we got to talk about visiting the doctor. Uh, usually the first visit is, is within two to three days after seeing, uh, after being discharged from the hospital. Oftentimes that, that time frame may vary depending on how things go in the hospital. Sometimes if there's concerns with the baby, they may not be feeding enough, they may have lost too much weight, they may be jaundiced, have a little bit of yellowness of the skin. That gets the doctor that sees them in the hospital a little bit concerned and, and may even want the baby seen the day after they go home. So we will usually follow the lead of whoever is the doctor that discharged, whether it's one of us or whether it's a doctor from uh, another hospital that, that the student is discharging and seeing the baby. After that, we'll see the baby, as I said, usually within a couple of days of going home. And this visit is very similar to pretty much all of our well care visits. So the first thing will happen is the child will come on in. And can we actually get to the next slide? Yeah, good. Child will come on in. Uh, you'll be brought into a room. Uh, somebody in the office, usually a medical assistant or a nurse, will then bring the baby, do our objective vital signs, do the measurement of the height, weight, head circumference, probably temperature, ask if there's any concerns, and then set the baby up to be seen by the doctor. At this point, we come on in and we do the next few stages of, of the exam. The first part of it is a history. It's to the point where we ask you tons of questions. Um, how's the baby doing? The questions usually will revolve around feeding, sleeping, some of the things you've heard from the other doctors so far that that uh, gonna drive you crazy as a parent bowel habits. Uh, how are you doing? We'll often be talking to the mom and dad. How are they doing? How are they dealing now being up 24 hours a day seemingly with this, with this child? Uh, at this point, you will be given hopefully plenty of time to ask questions and bring up your own concerns and point out issues that you may have so that we can direct that when we examine the baby to make sure everything's okay. After we go through the history, the next part is we do a thorough physical exam. From head to toe, we'll examine the baby, look in the eyes, ears, throat, listen to the heart and lungs, examine the belly, and more importantly, as Dr. Jesse would say, we, we will examine the hips to make sure there is nothing, nothing called hip dysplasia, which is a dislocated ability of the hip. When we're done with the head to toe exam, then we get to the part of the visit that I believe is probably the most important, which is the anticipatory guidance. This is where we will give you advice and talk to you about things to expect, how to keep your baby safe, talking about feeding advice for not only today, but also what you can expect going forward between now and the next time we see you. Safety issues, not only for today, but once again, as your baby develops, what you need to be watching out for and keeping them safe. At the end of this first visit, I always put in uh, one simple line that I tell every parent, and I have a simple rule in my office. There is no such thing as stupid questions from new parents. You've never done this before. You may have read books, you may have watched videos, you may even have participated in a webinar like this to get information. A lot of the information will make it seem like going home with your baby is gonna be black and white. In reality, you're looking forward to many years of greatness in your life. Nothing will be black and white. Um, so that's the first visit. Over the next couple of weeks, we will often see the baby um, two to three times to make sure that they're gaining adequate weight, that they're feeding well, that they're getting the nutrition they need. And after that, over those next couple of weeks, when we're certain everything's going well, we'll be satisfied. Uh, usually in one of those visits, about two weeks of age, we'll do the first of our screening analysis, and that is our maternal postpartum screening depression. 
depression screening, sorry. Um, it, it's amazing how often you would find out that the pediatrician is the first one to actually diagnose postpartum depression in a mom. They think everything's going well, we'll ask them to fill out the screen, we'll see something that concerns us, ask the parent, and the mother bursts in tears, and we know we have an issue. So then we, what we do is we work as a team with us, mom and dad, and then we'll even bring in the gynecologist obstetrician to work as a team to make sure the mom is okay, because if the mom's not okay, the baby's not gonna be okay. That leads us to our regular visits. After that, we have several well child care visits throughout the first year of life. Now, each office may have a slightly different schedule on how they approach this. Some schedules will see the baby every month for the first six months of their lives. Others may follow the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, recommendations, which is one month, one month visit, two months, four months, six months, nine months, and a year. Each one of those visits are pretty much similar to what I explained before with the uh, history, physical, anticipatory guidance, explaining what to expect for your child between now and the next visit so you know how to keep them safe and happy and healthy. Through many of these visits, you're going to see other screenings we're going to ask them, uh, ask you to fill out. They not only include, as I said, the postpartum depression. Through many of these visits, we're going to ask you to fill up a developmental screen, which is basically letting us know what developmental milestones your child is making, is meeting. Uh, that this can often give us a problem or, or information that a problem may be developing that the mom and dad are not aware that the child's not developing as, as needed and we need to help them out with that. At times we'll ask you to fill out a screening about whether your child is at risk for lead poisoning, if there's something in your house that can put them at higher risk. And same thing goes if the child is potentially at higher risk of coming in contact with tuberculosis. And that is basically what our visits are going to be like for the first year of life. Obviously, I've left out uh, the next uh, aspect of the visits, our vaccines. Okay. Um, as you can see on this list here on, on the screen, there were great many vaccines that the baby will receive in the first several months of life. This list can be daunting and overwhelming and scary to many parents. But these vaccines are all not only necessary, they are extremely important and exceptionally very safe for the babies. The first vaccine you're gonna come in contact with is usually the uh, hepatitis B vaccine, which is uh, usually recommended at the time of birth for the baby. Why is it given at the time of birth? Well, historically, if the mom has hepatitis B and during the time of birth, there may be a mixing of blood, the baby can catch the hepatitis B from the mom and therefore lead to a lifelong complications of the liver, possibly leading to things like cirrhosis and even a terminal illness. So it, we still think it is very important to do that vaccine, even though yes, most moms are tested for hepatitis B before we get to this point, never a bad idea to be safe. We get the second hepatitis B vaccine that usually the one month visit, and then when we get to the two month visit is when we start the rest of these vaccines. Now, some offices may, as I said before, do monthly visits as opposed to two, four and six month visit. So they may split up some of these vaccines so you don't get quite as many shots. A lot of offices will use a combination vaccine which puts several of these vaccines into one needle. Also to minimize the number of needles the baby will get. My office, we use something called a pentacel which combines the DTaP the diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis vaccine, uh, which to me, that is probably the most important vaccine the baby is going to receive. Pertussis and an illness in adults, it's a minor annoyance. You get a cough that lasts for weeks, if not months, but you get over it. In children, it is a potentially life-threatening infection. Okay. Um, with that, you're also going to get the Haemophilus influenza B vaccine, or what we call HIB, because we do not like to say Haemophilus influenza B all day long. HIB is, used to be the, a big cause of meningitis, infection covering the brain. It also used to cause respiratory and throat infections. I say used to because the vaccines have done what we've asked them to do. We, very few pediatricians can even remember the last time they've seen a, a case of these illnesses. Along with this is the polio vaccine. So that in my office, those three are combined into one. There were other combination vaccines. Along with those visits, we'll also give the pneumococcal or Prevnar vaccine. Pneumococcus also was a common cause of bacterial meningitis, infection covering the brain. 
It also causes the severe pneumonias, the, ten, the kind that tends to put your baby in the hospital. And also used to be a number one or a very big cause of children getting admitted to the hospital, which was a blood infection called bacteremia. Just like here, we don't see these uh, diseases very frequently because once again, the vaccines have done what we've asked it to do. Last in these visits, we were given oral vaccine called rotavirus. Long and short of it, rotavirus is the most severe stomach virus out there. Uh, it is one of the big reasons children would get admitted to the hospital. So they would get rotavirus, get dehydration, and need to be in the hospital for IV hydration. So these are the routine vaccines you would get either at two, four, and six, or some variation of those months. As you see, the last vaccine on that list is the influenza vaccine, the flu vaccine. The flu vaccine cannot be given to babies before they're six months of age. But at this point, at six months of age, is exceptionally important to give because the flu is an extremely severe, serious illness in children. We all understand that flu can be a devastating illness to those at higher risk. People who are, on, uh, uh, who are older, our 86-year-old grandmother, people with heart disease, lung disease, immunocompromised people can all be devastated by the flu. Children under the age of three fall into that same category and the flu can be devastating to those children also. Now on this list, there are vaccines that I strongly recommend that aren't even on this list. And believe it or not, we don't even, we're not even talking vaccines for the children. There are vaccines we strongly recommend the parents and close contacts in the baby should receive. And they are the Tdap, which is the adult version of what I said before, the DTAP, which is the adult tetanus and pertussis, and also the flu. Why? Well, our baby's not going to be protected against pertussis for the first six months of life until they've gone through this primary series. And we do know pertussis is a very common illness in the adult world. Unfortunately, most of us, if we got pertussis vaccine as a child, it didn't give us lifelong protection, and therefore we're at risk of it. Once again, it's minor to us, but spreading it to the child can be devastating. The flu, since we cannot give the flu until the shot to the baby is six months old, that could be a, an entire flu season. The baby born now, by the time they're available to get the flu shot, the flu season will be virtually over. So they'll be going through a whole season without protection. So with these two, our hope and our goal is to cocoon or bubble around the baby that everybody in close contact has these vaccines to dramatically decrease the risks of the baby coming infected with, uh, with these illnesses. And next slide. Okay, so that's me again. All right, so we're going to talk about a very common and worthwhile topic nowadays, obviously, with COVID and newborns. So thankfully, uh, so far in the six plus months that it's been here, uh, I have not seen one newborn with it thankfully. Um, and it's a pretty rarity for that to happen. So still have to have our guard up and be on the lookout for things, especially as the rates are slowly increasing. But a couple of factors about COVID. Um, first off, the transmission to neonates right now is really thought to be more from respiratory droplets. Um, thankfully, right now, there's most of the data out there. It's really unknown if there is any intrauterine transmission or going through the placenta. So thankfully, that's not a common thing as of right now that's being seen. Um, for any pregnant mother going to the hospital, just like for any other procedure, they are being tested for COVID to see if they have it. And if they do, if they are COVID positive, then the baby's getting tested at 24 and 48 hours of life via a nasal swab. Um, but again, thankfully, I have not seen any of that at this point in time. But even if we were positive, doesn't mean that you can't get involved in the feedings or the baby being near you, you might have to obviously put on a mask and wash your hands well and so forth. But if that happens, I'm sure that the hospital will tell you about what their policies are. Um, as far as some signs for babies, just like for anybody else, they could develop a fever. They could have some upper respiratory symptoms with the runny nose or congestion or coughing. It could be a little bit lethargic. Uh, it could be breathing a little bit fast. Um, from that end, you could have some vomiting and or diarrhea even have more of a poor feeder as well. And those are some symptoms. But thankfully, the majority of babies with it uh, are really asymptomatic or for the most part have a very mild disease. Remember in the height of this pandemic, uh, reading stories from the news of uh, a baby in, I think it was from China and a baby from Britain that a brand newborn that had it and they weren't symptomatic whatsoever and they did fine. 
So those are all thankful things there. Um, it's very rare for a baby to need to be vent, uh, to be intubated or need any uh, type of uh, ventilation from that regard. So thankfully, again, they've been doing okay. Now, some neonates that could be a little bit more at risk, uh, whether prematurity or if they have any underlying medical problems, they could be a little bit of an increased risk of, of the more severe illness. But again, they've been okay. And thankfully, uh, so far it's been found that COVID is not passing through any breast milk at that point in time. So if we do have any symptoms, even if you do have a cold at this point in time from a pregnant, uh, from a mom that has recently delivered, you should be probably wearing a mask at this point in time and washing hands very well anyway, just so your own child isn't getting sick, even whether it's COVID or not. Um, and at this point, even extra precautious because of COVID. Because uh, again, if we have a fever in the first month, maybe up to two months of life, we could be going to the hospital at that point. Um, and then just got to be careful with visitors and stuff. I know this is everybody's great moment and everybody wants to share in this great moment as they should. Um, but you got to limit the visitors to really a minimum, even in from a pre-COVID world, let alone from a post-COVID world as well. Um, you know, for the cousins or close family friends that want to share in this great moment, now might not be the best time. You have a lifelong as far as memories to be made here. And, you know, I, I wouldn't really recommend that. You know, you can definitely take the baby out on walks um, and enjoy the weather while we still can. I think the fresh air is obviously good there. But grandparents, obviously, they're going to want to be involved in this, as they should, too. Um, so at this point, you know, whether you're doing things outside with them could be good. If they're coming inside the house to help out, which is sometimes very needed, whether if they have to wear a mask or put on gloves or, wash their, or, or, or end up washing their own hands well, that would probably be a good idea as well. And when it comes down to it, you have things that are in your own control and things that are out of your own control. And things that are in your own control is other visitors that we just said on who you can avoid coming over. But things that are out of your own control is if you have another sibling back at home and now they are sick, whether it's COVID or not, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to ship that actual, you know, child out now for a full eight week time frame? It's not feasible at that point. So whether if you do have any support and, and any help with family or friends at that point, if your other sibling is sick, if they have to take the baby or, or, or take the actual sick kid to be taking care of them, that would be, you know, obviously helpful. And if not, then if you have to just try to separate as much as possible, you can only do so much there. But obviously, if you're having some of those issues, definitely talk to your, to, to your, pedi your pediatrician about that. All right, so next slide. Self-care, um, very hot topic among all sorts of um, work-related backgrounds, taking care of yourself in your accounting field or as a teacher or as a doctor. Most important time of your life for self-care is as newborn parent. You're gonna wanna do everything. Um, there, you will potentially feel a lot of pressure to have the perfect house and make sure the laundry's done and that the refrigerator is full, and that you're cooking home-cooked meals, and that your baby is changed immediately and nursed immediately, it's not going to happen. <laughs> it, it's okay to let the baby cry for a few seconds if you need to turn off the stove. It's okay if the laundry doesn't get done. It's okay to take the nap. If you're tired and your baby is sleeping, take advantage of that time to go lie down and rest yourself mom, dad, two moms, two dads, whatever your family combination is, you need to rest and take care of yourselves. If you're not resting and taking care of yourselves, you're going to be miserable and your baby's going to pick up on that. It's also going to lower your immune system so you could potentially get sick. We don't want that to happen. Take the time to rest. It's okay if the laundry piles up. Take the time to go outside and go for a walk. Like Dr. Jassy said, if it's nice out, take the baby out. Fresh air is good for babies. Don't let people come peering into the carriage and, and, you know, oh, cuddling the baby and touching, but go for the walk. Get that fresh air. Talk to friends on the phone. Take the nap. If you have support nearby, be it a family member, a really good friend, and you're just exhausted, call them up, ask them to come help you. Let them sit on the couch and fold the laundry for you while you take a nap or let them wear the mask and the gloves and the feed the baby while you go take a shower. It's really important you care for yourselves during this time because happy parents are happy babies. And babies are very resilient. They're not gonna remember that mommy was in the shower for an extra minute 
Well, they cried. It's okay. <laughs> they, they will be fine. Um, but take care of yourselves. Next slide. Harry, I think we're back to you. Dr. Yes. Firestein. Hi, how you doing? Oh. Uh, so, Allied. Uh, I, I, as I said in my introduction, I've been part of Allied since its inception, and we keep throwing out one phrase that describes who we are, and that we say over and over, we are Allied. What does that mean? What is Allied? Uh, Allied is an organization of, of pediatricians primarily who came together because we realized a great deal of what we were doing was not the strength of what we are. We were spending too much time doing administrative work, dealing with insurance companies, uh, dealing with regulations, and we were being taken away from the things we have been trained to do, do well and love to do, which is take care of patients. So then we formed Allied Pediatrics or Allied Physicians Group. Uh, over the years, this group has combined uh, and grown to include 34 offices from uh, all the way up in, in Rockland and Westchester counties, through the boroughs of New York City, through Nassau County, Suffolk County, and even now towards our wine country out there on Long Island. Um, all the offices, as, as Dr. Firestein said in her original statement, are owned and run by doctors. They're not run by hospitals, we're not run by corporations, we're run by doctors, and our goal all along from the very first was to allow our doctors, our offices, to still be the local community office and practice that you've always known, but now with support to allow them to do what we can do the best we can, can to help your child grow and mature. We have been able through our growth to do things that other groups may not have been able to do. We have developed a division of lactation consultants, uh, teams of consultants, nurses. We even have pediatricians who specialize in lactation medicine to help moms, new moms who are trying to breastfeed, have all the support humanly possible. If you want to breastfeed, we will give you everything you need to do to make it successful. Uh, we have brought on teams of asthma care educators who will help our asthma patients, which is an extremely common illness in childhood, um, understand how to use their medicines, when to use the medicines, what are the signs and symptoms the concern. They will work with not only our pediatricians, even our, our in-house allergists and pulmonologists, or allergists and pulmonologists who are not in the allied umbrella just to make sure that the children with asthma are able to, to excel and, and maximize their health and well-being. Um, through that, all these processes, we've worked together. And it's one of the joys of Allied is being able to help each other out, find out best practices, talking to each other in either informal meetings or informal conversations. How do you do this? How do you approach this situation? All with one goal in mind to create the best practices so that we can be the best doctors for your child. As Dr. Firestein said before, one of our joys of Allied is that we are independent. We're not beholden to a hospital system or a corporation. We can choose to do what we want to with our patients. So if we feel a cardiologist at this hospital is better for your child, that's the one we choose. If we feel the, the infectious disease doctor from another center is the one, that's what we choose because we have the freedom to do that. I believe during this whole time of COVID is actually the time I was most proud to be part of Allied. It's, it's an illness that not only affected the entire world and country, but it affected great many pediatric offices and affected our families. And with it, we were able to come together and figure out the best ways to keep our families, keep our patients safe, whether it's how to structure the office, how to structure your day, um, how to make sure that the children are brought in and receive the care they receive in the safe way possible. And, and I think one of the big things that surprised me when we did this is as we were Heading into COVID, before COVID, we started the telemedicine initiative in which we had partnered with a telemedicine company to help us offer our remote care for our patients. And some of our offices were doing it and we were rolling it out. All of a sudden, COVID hit. And we realized that this was going to be an extremely important platform for our patients to be able to interact with us, for us to offer care in a safe way for our patients. 
and through the hard work of our executives, our staff, and our doctors, we got every office, every clinician, every provider up and running on the EMR, sorry, uh, on the telemedicine and, and excelling at it within days. It, it was truly warp speed. Yeah. And I will admit, before this happened, and Dr. Firestein knows this, I am, was not a big fan of telemedicine before uh, COVID hit. I, I guess I'm a bit old school, or my kids will tell you I'm just a bit old. Uh, I still like the hands-on examining of the child and looking at them, but I've come to realize that even as we're not needing it as much because the fear of COVID has dampened a little bit, and our office are now fully up and running again, that there will be a place for COVID, whether it's to take care of the parent who just doesn't feel comfortable coming to the office or cannot because they have four other kids and they can't get them all in or they don't have the support to take care of the other children, whether it's inclement weather or just they can't do it. Certain processes. We, we have a great many children with educational issues, psychiatric issues that we will be helping them maintain uh, their medical regimen and the therapies they will receive. And we frequently have to have them come on in so we can see what we're doing works. And telemedicine is beautiful for that so that we can actually continue our care with them and they don't have to come to our office. And this has worked out great for the kids who are going to college because now we can continue taking care of them and making sure that our treatment regimen has worked for them and, and the changes they've had to go through if and when they actually get a real college experience. Um, long story short, Telemedicine is not going to change. It's not going to take over what we do and make the use of the in-office pediatrician. It's just, once again, a tool we have to help us provide care and, and, and well-being to our patients. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Firesey for the Q&A session. Thank you, Dr. Peck and Dr. Wilson and Dr. Jassy. Um, this was really wonderful. And... While I knew the answers to all the questions that we asked, it's always interesting to me to see everybody's little take and, and how, they, um, how they do different things. We are going to do a few questions. I, I answered a bunch while, while things were going on, um, and we don't like to keep people too long. Um, but I did want to say that while we all can't go to um, see Dr. Svitak in Comac, there are a lot of allied physicians all over um, Lower New York and going into Monroe. If you go to the website, you will see where all our offices are. There is a, a search engine where you can look to see based on your geography. There are also more of these um, newborn um, webinars that we have videoed over the past few months. So if there's um, one, an off, a different office that you might wanna go to, there might be a video with that doctor on it or one of the doctors there that might be interesting. Also, each doctor, like I said, does things differently. You might find that helpful. Um, Dr. Jassy mentioned swaddling. I've done a series of baby basics with my newborn grandson. And one of the videos I have is on swaddling. I am also a really big fan of swaddling and doing it right. And if you follow the video, you'll see how to do it. And there is also an advanced swaddling technique that I will just um, tease you about and you could go check it out for yourself. We also do the newborn exam, the one month exam, the two month exam. And there's a lot of educational content on the website. So even if you're not able to go to an allied office, you may find that that's really helpful as well. So I did answer a bunch of questions. Um, I didn't have enough time to, answer, to type the answer to this one. So I am going to give this to Dr. Jassy. Um, how long should a baby sleep in a bassinet in the parents' room before moving to their own crib and room? Okay, um, as far as the bassinet, it's really when they start to outgrow it, which generally, and or, and or when they are also looking to be rolling over, which generally happens on average, maybe by four to five months at the latest, is usually when, once they start rolling over. So uh, once they're really looking too big in there uh, or they are really rolling over and they don't have enough space, then going inside the crib would be best. At that point, uh, it should still be in the parents' room. Newer studies are suggesting potentially even in the first year of life. Um, I, at least for the first four to six months of life, I think would be good. Uh, and once I feel like they're sleeping through the night, 
I, I personally feel like that is an okay avenue on when they could be in then their own room because even if you have a a, a a monitor next to them and they're technically still you know next to you at that point in time, I, I feel like at that point in time once they're seeping through and they and they feel content, uh, that that would be a, a, an a definitely an appropriate avenue at that point in time. Um, so then, you know, if you are moving around at night or if you have to go to the bathroom, then, you know, hopefully they aren't such a actual light sleeper that they might be waking up at that point in time. But generally, probably for the first four to six months of life, they should be in your own room at least. So that would be my answer to that one. Okay, good answer. Um, Dr. Goldstein. So Dr. Svitek did a great job about explaining what all the vaccines are for. Um, but given that we're all staying inside and everybody's masked, um, do you think it's really that important to follow them, um, you know, the way it's supposed to, or can we delay them a little bit? That's an excellent question. Um, I'm in an area where there is an interesting population that was, until recently, largely unvaccinated. And we've seen measles, and we've seen mumps, and these are diseases that were pretty much eradicated in the United States because of viruses, um, vaccines. My own husband had varicella meningitis a few years ago, and I almost lost him. We were not of the age to have a varicella vaccine. We got varicella, chicken pox. And instead of getting shingles like an adult normally gets, it attacked his brain. And it's been a long road back. There are bacteria and viruses everywhere. Most of us as adults have developed some immunity to it through either vaccine or through having had the illness. But the germs can still be on us, in us. Um, you may be a carrier and unaware. You may have gone out to the supermarket and touched the handle of the shopping cart and someone with pertussis coughed all over it and you brought that germ home. Vaccines are important. They save lives. You need to stay on schedule, even during COVID and quarantine. You don't want your child to get a vaccine preventable illness. Many of them are deadly or life altering. So we recommend them. Keep in mind that the majority of us are parents and we would never ask you to do something we did not do for our own children. But having seen how horrible these illnesses are firsthand through my patients and my own family, I beg you to stay on schedule. Wow, that's, thank you for sharing that personal experience. Um, you know, I do think a lot of parents think, well, it'll only be a little bit, um, or only de delay it a little bit. Um, or sometimes they'll even ask me, well, you know, which one should I put off? Um, and I always say, well, I don't know, which deadly disease can you promise me your child's not gonna be exposed to, right? Um, and even if you delay it a month, what happens is then the baby gets a cold. So then you delay it a little longer. And then before you know it, your whole schedule is, is off because one goes to the next one, goes to the next one. So if you delay one, you've now, instead of being fully vaccinated by six months of age, and, you know, hopefully in six months, we're all going to be at least out there doing more things. Um, you know, it's going to be eight months or nine months. So, uh, I agree with you. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, I, I, also like that to point out to parents that vaccines are studied in a certain grouping and in a certain time frame. And when you vary from that time frame, we don't know that they'll be as effective as we know them to be. Um, we also need to keep in mind, I, I'm in my late 40s. The vaccines I got as a child, there were about five of them, had 3,000 antigens. That's the protein you develop immunity to. In all the vaccines your children will get from birth to age 21, there's only 300 antigens. That's a huge difference in, in protein challenge. You get more challenge from touching a doorknob or your baby putting something that fell on the floor into its mouth than you get from the vaccines. They're very safe. And you need to stick with the time frame so that we know that you're 98% protected against hoop and cough or 99% protected against measles. We really should end on that because that's such a strong point, but I'm going to ask one more question since uh, it came up a few different times in, in the write-ins that people had. Um, the question is about spitting up. So I have a three-month-old who is still struggling with spitting up. Um, Dr. Svitek, can you just talk about 
spinning up? What's normal? What's not when you have to be worried? Sure. Uh, and then you're looking at a, a, a doctor whose son spit up for the first six months of his life. And uh, my wife always laughed. I always had an extra shirt on my way to work because it invariably got covered with sped up as I took my son to daycare. Uh, spitting up throughout the first several months of life is extremely common. And the vast, vast, vast majority of time is not an issue for the child. We get concerned with spitting up if it leads to the point that the child is not keeping enough food down, that they're not able to meet their growth and milestones, like Dr. Jassy said before, if they're not gaining weight appropriately. Sometimes, rarely, the spinning up will bleed acid into the esophagus and irritate that, and the child may need a treatment with potential and antacid medicine to, to keep them from being exceptionally cranky. Other than that, if the baby's growing and thriving, it's a mess, it's a nuisance, but it's okay. And unless their baby is having trouble growing, I don't get overly concerned about spinning up. Excellent. And any of these questions that you have, your pediatrician is the source. So all of us here, we're all happy to talk to our patients, um, whether it's at visits, by telemedicine, in between. That's why you have to get a pediatrician who you're comfortable with. And somebody brilliant tonight said there is no such thing as a stupid question. Um, so thank you all. Everybody is going to get a copy of this webinar email to them. Um, we'll do a follow-up email tomorrow. Feel free to pass it along to anybody who you think might benefit from the information. And I want to thank my panelists, thank everybody for listening, and good luck with your babies, and we hope to see you at our offices soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>